Let's start with some definitions. I am going to have to make some simplifications, otherwise the video would get too long. As we move forward, I am going to refer to terms such as force-free, modern, humane, or even lima, the least intrusive, minimally aversive, to refer to trainers that prioritize the use of low-risk, non-aversive options, such as antecedent arrangement and positive reinforcement, when modifying dog behavior. These trainers will be aware of the potential problems of more invasive options, such as positive punishment, negative reinforcement and extinction, for example. They will try to tackle any behavior modification goal with the least aversive option possible. For balanced dog training, a common definition that can be found online is that it is training that uses both positive reinforcement along with physical punishment and or physical corrections. During this video, I will refer to balanced dog trainers as trainers that will potentially use any behavior modification technique across the spectrum of options with a similar frequency and that do not seem to have a robust preference for antecedent arrangement and positive reinforcement. We will come back to the hierarchy of behavior modification procedures a little bit later in the video. One common claim is that there is more than one way to train a dog. This is true. You can, for example, use lure reward training, shaping, or the do as I do method, which are just a few examples on how to train a dog humanely. But note that none of these options require physical force and intimidation. Focusing on good antecedent arrangement and positive reinforcement training is a highly effective way of changing how a dog thinks, feels, reacts and behaves. Science has consistently shown that punitive techniques are not more efficient than positive reinforcement based techniques. Dogs trained using punishment based techniques experience much more stress and anxiety during training. This type of training also generates significantly less engagement with the trainer. If we can teach our dogs without causing them extreme stress and discomfort, why would we not choose the more humane option? Let's look at a very well-known behavior, loose leash walking, from two different approaches a force-free positive reinforcement-based approach and a balanced training approach. With the first option, we set up the environment for success and we use positive reinforcement to make the correct behavior happen more in the future. With the second option, we set up the environment for an advanced version of the behavior from the get-go and we correct any mistakes that happen. One potential example of the first option would be to prepare a session in an environment that the dog knows well. For example, with a few cones so that you remember to stop and reinforce each time you reach one of those cones. You can then increase the distance between reinforcement and you can also slowly start to introduce the dog to more challenging environments. With the balanced training approach, however, one possibility would be to go straight into a very demanding and distracting environment. Sometimes in balanced dog training, you'll also see corrective tools, such as a prong collar. In this case, the human and the dog start walking in a given direction. And every time the dog puts tension on the leash, he gets a physical correction through the prong collar. A balanced dog trainer can also use a combination of positive reinforcement training and physical corrections. For example, if the dog is walking without any tension on the leash, he might receive some positive reinforcement. If, on the other hand, the dog reaches the end of the leash and puts some tension on it, he might receive a correction through the prong collar. Now let me ask you this. Which way do you think is the best learning environment? Another potential problem is that suppressing behavior can also be reinforcing for the human. But what has the dog learned? If you suppress behavior by using corrections, what do you think that that might do to your relationship with your dog? Do you really want to walk your dog the way you want because the dog 
is basically afraid of you and in a state of learned helplessness? It is important to know how to identify a balanced trainer. So here is an excerpt from a balanced trainer's website. Quote, to ask for a sit, I pull up on the prong collar or slip lead and release the pressure when my dog's butt hits the ground. Once the dog associates that pressure with the sit command, I can correct when he does not sit when I ask. Generally, the trainer starts by using a slip lead or a prong collar. Using these tools, the dog will learn that they can control when they receive the pressure and when it is released. Once the dog is fluent with this language, we introduce the e-collar." One popular argument in favor of using a balanced approach is that it uses all four quadrants of operant conditioning and thus is more complete. However, this does not paint the complete picture. Force-free trainers are fully aware of all four quadrants and how they work. They are also aware that any living animal will be exposed to all four quadrants, without the need for us to use that as our primary tool for behavior modification. A force-free trainer prioritizes the use of antecedent arrangement and positive reinforcement training because he or she is aware of the detrimental side effects of more invasive procedures, such as positive punishment through physical or verbal corrections. The hierarchy of behavior change procedures by Dr. Susan Friedman is a great way to explain how a force-free modern trainer can deploy a variety of procedures that intentionally choose to prioritize low-risk options to address behavior modification. For example, if we can modify a behavior by altering its antecedents, this will be a preferred option to using extinction or negative reinforcement. Another common argument is that a force-free approach does not work with aggressive dogs. This seems to suggest that the science of behavior modification does not apply to these dogs, which is a flawed argument. If anything, a reactive dog can benefit even more, not less, from good planning, efficient antecedent arrangement, and positive reinforcement training. Okay, dear viewers, it is now time to science the out of this. A very quick disclaimer to let you know that a lot of the information on this topic is more correlational than causational. One of the reasons behind this is probably that comparing positive reinforcement training to training that includes physical corrections would raise ethical issues with most research ethics committees and thus struggle to receive ethics approval. With that said, peer-reviewed papers and articles is still the absolute best tool we have to make informed decisions. According to this first paper, we learned that the more often people used rewards in training, the more likely they were to say that their dog was obedient and the less likely they were to report aggression or anxiety. We also learned that the more often people used punishment, the more likely they were to say that their dogs were aggressive or excitable. This paper also reports that for little dogs, the risks are increased because the more often punishment was used, the more likely the dog was to be anxious and fearful too. This second paper from 2009 shows us that there are strong correlations between using physical punishment with dogs and aggressive responses from them. For example, 11% of owners who used prong collars, a common tool for balanced dog trainers, reported that it led to aggression. 15% of dog handlers who yelled no at their dog also said that it sometimes led to aggression. Among dog owners who said that they hit or kick their dogs for undesirable behavior, 43% of them said that there was an aggressive response from the dog. An article published in the Journal of Applied Animal Behavior Science showed that using a shock collar resulted in behavior such as lowering of body posture, high-pitched yelps, barks and squeals, avoidance, redirection aggression and tongue flicking, which suggests stress, fear, and pain. The authors compared S-dogs, the ones in which an electric collar was used, to C-dogs, 
the ones in which no electric collar was used, and found that S dogs showed a lower ear posture and more stress-related behaviors than C dogs. Quote, the conclusions therefore are that being trained is stressful, that receiving shocks is a painful experience to dogs, and that S dogs evidently have learned that the presence of their owner or his commands announces receptions of shocks, even outside of the normal training context. This suggests that the welfare of these shocked dogs is at stake, at least in the presence of their owner." End quote. According to this 2013 article, owners who used punishment-based collars were less satisfied with their dogs' overall unleash-walking behaviors. The authors encourage owners to select dogs based on compatible behaviors, to offer the dogs an appropriate environment and to train using positive reinforcement methods. This will likely decrease the chances of relinquishing their dogs to shelters. This review paper looked at 17 studies on the topic of dog training methods. The author advises that aversive training methods can be highly detrimental to the physical and mental well-being of dogs. He also states that even though Punitive techniques can be effective, there is no evidence of them being more effective than positive reinforcement training. There is actually some evidence that the opposite is true, and three studies analyzed in this review demonstrate that. The article also mentions Susan Friedman's hierarchy of intervention strategies, and flags it as a great tool for the, quote, least intrusive yet effective behavior modification tools, end quote. Given that these procedures work very well and that often the most vulnerable animals and humans that require behavior modification cannot protect themselves, these guidelines from the field of applied behavior analysis should be used. The author also says that, quote, positive reinforcement carries less risk of negative unintended outcomes, end quote. This paper is one of the few dealing with dog-to-dog -dog aggression. In it, we learn that dogs that were trained by hitting or shaking and dogs owned by individuals who believed that without training a dog will be out of control tended to be on the aggressor side of dog-to-dog -dog aggression encounters. In contrast, dogs of owners who believed that training should be fun and that it would be advantageous to have a trained dog were found to be more often on the victim side of these encounters. This other study surveyed dog owners and found that there was a lower number of undesirable behaviors for dogs exposed to the use of positive reinforcement training. Punishment-based techniques were associated with a higher number of undesirable behaviors. The authors also explain that dogs may be associating the punishment with the person or scenario in which it occurs, instead of with their own behavior. This can lead to fear or anxiety in the presence of the person or in similar contexts to the ones in which the dog gets punished. The authors found the highest aggression scores for dogs whose owners used a combination of positive reinforcement and positive punishment. Additionally, the use of punishment techniques in the context of dog-to-dog -dog aggression increased behaviors associated with anxiety. I hope I have provided you with plenty of evidence to pursue training procedures that do not rely on aversive techniques to modify dog behavior. And I will leave you with one final thought. Over the course of my life, Whenever I see a divergence of opinions on a topic that is important for me, I always ask myself the question, what do the specialists do? Do the people with PhDs and masters in the behavioral field use verbal and physical corrections in an attempt to achieve a balanced dog training approach? No, they don't. So why should we?